Hey, everybody. Hey, Charles. Hi. Okay. Well, all two of you. Okay. All two of us. Yeah, we've been awaiting your arrival. <laughs> okay. That's fair. Well, I'm here. Good. You know, in spite of uh, all the trials and tribulations of the day. So, what's going yeah. on? Um, for some reason, I had to move downstairs because I was not getting a good internet connection up in the studio. Ah. So I had to get closer to the router. Hmm. Okay. Hang on. I got to get my coffee. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to function. I gotcha. <laughs> yeah. uh, but beyond that, you know, um, you know, you know, just one of those small technical. Yes. Uh, yes. So that, that's why you're having all the issues, probably. I don't know. You know, it's it's like most of the time, I don't have any problem getting the signal up there. Huh. Because I actually have what they call a repeater. Oh, which right. Is, which is like, you know, at this end of the house to help boost the signal. Down. Right, right. And for the most part, I don't have any problem, you know, up there. Um, but on some days, mm. for whatever reason. Whatever reason, yeah. It just doesn't want to seem to work. So, anyway. Well, hopefully, you know, we'll get a few more people here. It is two o'clock, and it is. Yeah, I don't know. I wonder where After everybody spring. is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could be spring. Huh. You know, it could be. You know, I mean, it's nice out. It's sunny. It's warm. You yeah. know, people may be like, you know, I just want to get out and soak up some sunshine today. That could be. It could be. Okay. But uh, at any rate, um, since you guys are here, we're going to get started anyway. Wow. And, um, <laughs> might as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, worst case scenario, you know, we'll have a short class. So, That's our class. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can get outside and soak up some. some, some, yeah. some well, I, I, I've been out already, so. Have you? Out and back. Yep. And I was over. Went over to the center for lunch at Benson. Did you see Armando over there? No, he wasn't there. Uh -uh. Oh, really? Huh. Okay. <laughs> How odd. Yeah, I figured yeah. he would be camped out over there waiting for lunch. So. Well, that's what I would have thought. Uh, that I was a little bit earlier than, but with the class being at, you know, at 2 o'clock today, I figured he'd be there earlier. Mm hmm Yeah. But, Oh well, okay. But yeah. there are quite a few people around taking uh, taking classes and things like that. I talked to a few people, mm -hmm. and they're taking classes and having lunch. Yeah, what kind of classes were they taking today? I mean, well, um, well there was a, some of the one gal I talked to was doing aquatic, one of the aquatic classes. Okay. And um, the uh, Marjan group was there. Sylvia and uh, Viola mm -hmm. was there. Jeff, uh, computer guy, he was there. Oh, okay. So they had a kind of a variety of stuff going on. Yeah, a variety of stuff going on, yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah, it, it seems like it's, you know, it's like the word is getting around. People are beginning to kind of go back a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think that's what it is, so. yeah. So, Hopefully, yeah. So uh, yeah, I spoke to Sabrina yesterday. Uh, she's actually wanting me to come in two days a week now. Oh wow! Well, she wants me to come in because I guess we have a well. We need to fire and finish a lot of the ceramic stuff that was kind of left in limbo when the uh, right, right. Yeah. And there's a bunch of it back there. So. Yeah. So uh, I may be doing the afternoon class on Thursday, you know, from uh, Vincent. What about, what about the gal that was there doing the ceramics? Uh, she's not coming back. Yeah, uh, yeah she, she's moved. Evidently, she's moved on. Uh, so, yeah, she won't be, be back doing classes. So, uh, 
now she's said that she'll come come in and help as far as identify who's whose is what because that's, uh, that's going to be one of my big problems is there's a lot of stuff back there from her class that i have no idea right. who did it and right yeah there's no name on it or anything it's just mm -hmm. it's like okay <laughs> you know if i fired it you know, it's like who does it go back to you know so right <laughs> So yeah, there's, yeah, it's going to take a while, you know, and, you know, big picture looking at it, you know, I mean, this is kind of, you know, what you would kind of expect because of the way that the center shut down, it just happened so suddenly, you know, right. you know there was really no, uh, you know, no way to get back in there and, you know, finish the right. up. So, no. Yeah. And it's been two years. So, yes, I don't know a few of the people I saw today look two years older. <laughs> did they? As I probably did to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. You know, some people, you know, uh, are claiming that uh, the two years have helped them actually look younger. So. Oh, okay. I, I can't. Know. I don't think I can claim. I can't claim that. <laughs> can't claim that. Yeah, you know, I don't think I can either, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm probably a good, you know, twenty to thirty pounds heavier and and yeah, I probably look two years older. Yeah. You know, I've probably got more gray in my beard and hair now than I yeah. did when right. I no. so anyway. Um uh, June's here. Yes. Okay. There we go. So uh, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna basically kind of go through the work that was sent in and Susan and John and June, uh, you know, we'll look at your stuff since you're here, okay? Not particularly in that order, but, you know, okay. Um, and then we'll go back, and if other people show up, you know, we'll take a look at their work as well. All right, so uh, this is, well, you know, this is something that Armando did. We're not going to spend much time looking at it because... He's not here. So we're going to go down to Mr. Gigliotti. Okay. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> you are here. Um, and uh, you have quite a, uh, quite a dark city scene. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. And this looks like a nocturne, right? I would, I would yes. guess. Night. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, what is it that inspired you to paint this? Uh, in uh, Kermis class, uh, the, one, the landscape, one of his landscape classes a week or two ago, uh, mm -hmm. he, he started using, for the underpainting, uh, he did the dark top and then the, the reddish bottom. Okay. And he didn't do a city scene, he did more of a, a beach type scene with Hudson things, but uh, I wanted to see if I could sort of translate into watercolor what he was doing in oil. So okay. this was my attempt. <laughs> okay. so I did so I did do the background first in the dark and the, and the reddish, and then I painted the buildings over. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's and I'm calling it after the rain. <laughs> All right, so. I have a couple questions for you about this. Okay. Sure. You know, I, I'm curious. Is uh, it, it's interesting to hear, you know, kind of the process that you kind of were talking about. So you you basically created a gradation from top to bottom, from dark, you know, to the kind of mid tone red, right? Yeah. Correct. Now, did did you at the same time though, or anywhere along the point? you know, sort of plan out and sketch where the position of the buildings and things were? Or did you- Not at all, it? not at all. I had I had no idea, I just sort of followed because it's hard to get a real smooth finish. You can see the brush strokes. And mm -hmm. so I just sort of followed the brush strokes. <laughs> okay, all right. So yeah, I, had, I had really had no intention what I was gonna do mm -hmm. uh, as far as the scene itself. Okay. All right. Um, okay. 
And so you didn't really, were, were you looking at something or is this the- No, it, all, all out of my screwed up head. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know, we're all a little warped up there. Anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and it looks, it looks at some point like you went in and you put in some okay. Color in. Yes, right. The, the, the whites, yes, right. Uh huh. Okay. And, and on the actual piece, do they seem to be brighter than they photographed here? or is No, that that's pretty good because I tried several different photographs to get the most true uh, representative of what it looked look like. So that's, that's pretty close to the You're coloration. Close. Okay. All right. Um, and I guess the final question I have is, are you looking at this as this, this is it, this is done now, right? This is, yeah, it's in my mind, it's done. I, I'm thinking it's, I don't know, I guess I'd call it sort of an abstract. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So. <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, it's not my normal fare. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. And like I said, it got me curious as to, okay, so what kind of inspired you to do is this? Yes. Um, because it does. It looks, it looks a little bit dark. And when I say dark, I don't just mean in value. I mean, it looks kind of maybe a little kind of menacing, threatening. Yeah, om ominously dark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of like the place you don't want to be, you know, at right. 2 a.m. in the morning when you're car Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, nobody in the street. Yeah. Um, so I got a couple comments about it, okay? Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would really like some comments, definitely. Because yeah. it's, it's, it's definitely out of my, out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, okay. Uh, it definitely has a mood to it, you know, so it is a, an impactful piece in the sense that when you see it, you definitely have kind of an emotional reaction to it, okay? Okay. And it's, it's that kind of dark, you know, ooh, this kind of is looking a little spooky, okay? Um, but then on the technical side of it, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you definitely understand and have, you know, pretty much so gotten down, you know, this sense of lineal perspective, you know, and it's, it's more or less a one point perspective. Um, right. yeah. But it, it's kind of interesting because as you move back, I mean, your horizon line is like really here. And, and yet, right about, yeah. yeah. But you have a little bit of activity going on back here in the center, center that's up right. of it. Right. And, and yes. it, you know, and it might, you know, I mean, you could read it as, you know, something that you would actually see in the inner city, you know, sort of like, you know, other buildings and things back here in the background, or, you know, maybe this is a, a, a hillside or a ridge or something, you know, off in the distance. Right. And right. you almost get a hint of lights being on back there, you know, right, you correct. Yep. okay, and, uh, and I like that, I mean, you know, it definitely pulls you back to the back, and piques your interest as to what's going on back there at the city scene, um, you know, and then the architecture as it comes forward, you know, the scale of it, things like that all work, you know, as far as you know, it makes you feel like, you know, you're, you're definitely in between these buildings. Um, now, oddly enough, though, at the same time, because of the angles, things like that, it doesn't feel like you're on the street. It kind of feels like... No, right, you know, it's like you're above, a little bit above it, I think, right? Yeah, kind of like on a walkway or maybe, yeah. you know, maybe right. there's a overpass or something that you're standing on looking right. down the street. Yeah. Yeah, because you feel a little bit elevated by it, you know, like right. you're, you're not really, you know, down there. And, um, and that's fine. You know, I guess my question to you would be, um, 
creating some sharper, you know, higher contrast lights. Um, you seem to have sort of like, you know, an area that's glowing up here. It could be like a moon or something like that. Right, right, and, yes. And so, you know, mm -hmm. why not keep developing that, you know, into something that's, you know, brighter. Now that means you, you would have to use the watercolor dryer and use that china white or bright white or whatever you have. Uh -huh. right. yep. Really kind of lay a nice thick, you know, puddle of it right there and then right. not mess with right. it. Yep. So it would sit on top. You know, mm -hmm. you could also add just mm -hmm. the tiniest little touch of yellow to it, mm -hmm. you know, and warm it up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That yeah. or leave that mm -hmm. stark white, which is cool or cold actually. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, here in some of the windows, and I would mm -hmm. be crazy with it, but, you know, maybe five or six, you know, just rectangular little shapes to indicate windows with possibly lights on them, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean... Uh, that's the other thing in my mind, I was trying to figure out how the, the lighting would affect the where it would be on the building, so that was, mm -hmm. again, and. and Trying to figure that out in my head too. Yeah, well, they're they're rather kind of elongated, narrow rectangles because of right. the view. You know, they're not going to be squares. You know, they're going to be rectangles, and they're going to be kind of elongated. Uh, you know, and you've already got some of the spaces sort of indicated. For yes, the correct. Openings of windows, and right. so, you know, it's just taking a. You know, small to medium size, you can take a flat brush and just, you know, make a paint stroke, you know, starting here and just go down a little way. Right, right. You know, and just knock in, like I said, you know, you don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to do like every window, but you could do, right. you know, three or four, maybe five. Right. Yeah. You know, you just here or there. So there's like a light on in the building or something like that. Uh, right, so it's your main right. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, it was just, it's going to give it a wider range of value, right, in contrast. So, uh, and it would also, you know, possibly give it some interest, you know, as far as you, you kind of see the lights on. So, you know, there. Well, I, I thought of that too, sort of. Then I was thinking, well, that would give us sort of a, a Kincaid look, which I didn't really want to do. So. <laughs> Um, well, you know, as, as long as you didn't put flower pots outside underneath the window, <laughs> I think you'd be okay. You know, yeah. I, I think this is a, a bit industrial and dark and ominous enough that, you know, you're not going to go anywhere near, you know, uh, Kincaid. So, pretty safely. Okay. Yeah. That's my thought. So, anybody else got anything to, any, anybody see anything? Got any? Comments about this? Suggestion? Is it makes me got... feel like I'm really on the docks in New Jersey. That's what it makes me feel like. So that's good. That's a good uh -huh. thing. I like it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It kind of feels, yeah, like, you know, yeah, kind of a port, kind of city type. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? <clears throat> no? You guys are so quiet. Uh, has everybody had their coffee today? <laughs> everybody check their pulse, make sure they're uh, they functional. I won't, I won't be offended if you say negative things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, look, you know, I mean, we're all here. Hey, you. All here to learn, you know, from each other. Are you sure you're going you to be hiding somewhere with a two by four in your hand? Uh, Armando, yes. you see this corner right here? There is a guy hanging out behind there waiting for you. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm not so sure he would have a two by four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, whatever. You know, something. Well, well, that was my intention to let let the viewer come up with their own. Uh, thoughts about what it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and an image like this, you know, brings up all kinds of things, you know, for different right. different people who have different experiences with it. And um and you and you could, you know, you really can't come up with a lot of different stories, you know, in this. Yes. And um, you know, the way you use color is one of those things that can really help set the mood. And in this case, you know, it being red and black um, and white, really. Uh, what is, you know, what in our world is red, black, and white? Mm -hmm. It's a question. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you What do you encounter in life that's red, black, and white? I don't know. Not a stop much. Sign? I, a what? A stop sign. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think they make it red, black, and white? I don't know. High contrast tells you, you know, caution. Oh, okay. Okay. Danger, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that's the purpose of picking those colors, was to sort of alert you to, you know, some possible danger. Okay. Get you to stop. Um. I I had fun doing it. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. I, did, I was, you get, did you get my uh, my drawings from Friday? I sent them Friday right after class. Hmm. I send them my I, too. Yeah, I got yours. Okay. Uh, let me go. Let me go see. I sent them right after class on Friday. All right. Oh well. It's you know, Friday evening is a uh, um, happy hours, uh, John. Ah, is that what it is? Okay. <laughs> okay. So your concern is that I headed out to happy hour too early? And I, I missed the incoming email? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't really remember seeing anything, but let's go take a look. Um, you know, it's easy enough to do, right? To jump. Okay, so yeah, it was Friday right after class that I sent them. Okay, Sunday, Armando, Glenn Darby. There's that the names of theme again. Uh, okay, so I I got. Uh, Eloise. Let's see what I got from Eloise. Hmm. Okay. Um, like I said, I got one from Eloise. I'm still looking for yours. I know you were having trouble here with your computer or the whatever, the Wi Fi at Friday. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, right under her is yours. Yeah. Okay. So evidently, uh, Armando was right. I was uh, I was too engaged and happy, uh. <laughs> <laughs> or something. You know, because yeah, they uh, snuck right by me. Uh, and you got two of them, right? Correct. Yes, the two views. Let me get those real quick. I mean, it's not like we have you know, tons of work that we have to work with. Yeah. <laughs> We, you know, we can take a little bit of time to do this. Not a problem. Uh, well, thank you all for your, thank you for your comments on my, my watercolor because I, I was yeah that I was searching for. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, you know, it's uh, you know, it's a striking piece, and you know, it definitely has uh, kind of a, a strong reaction to it. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, okay. Um, 
to your ladies out there. Um, And then we'll get back to it. But, uh, I mean, you know, and this is just me, but I would like to see you, you know, take that and go a little further with it. Yeah. And, um, and see what you can do with it. Mm. You know? Right. Now, there's a couple different ways you could do that. Um, you could, in fact, either choose to uh, close that. Okay. Uh, you could either choose to, like, start like a new piece right right and you know based on that same theme you know do it again in other words mm -hmm. um but make changes you know right. um you know the composition itself doesn't really need to be altered it's it's really you know just plan or think about those lights um and where you you know where you might want some stronger light, um, you know, and, and put it in there, you know, plan for it. And, and plus the fact that if you're doing it a second time, any of the problems that you ran into before and had to encounter, you mm -hmm. can kind of find work around for it and, you, and see if you can get a better effect, um, you know, in that sense. Do you know of any way of get, uh, like painting, like I did the backgrounds of not showing the, the brush strokes getting in more even with watercolor? Yeah, yeah. I tried it, I tried it watery and I tried it, you know, drier and uh, I, I still always get the strokes. <laughs> right. So I can tell you exactly what you're doing and, and then what not to do. Okay. Um, <laughs> What you're doing is you're overworking the paint. Ah, okay. Uh, so, in other words, when you lay that color in, you right. know, you're spending a lot of time brushing over it, trying to smooth correct, it. Correct. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't do that with watercolor. Yeah. You know, you got to put it down, let it be wet, and then you got to kind of step back and let go of it and let it kind of do its thing. You know. And it's gonna, it's gonna kind of flow and spread the way it's gonna flow and spread. Right. And and just let that be, you know. Uh, if you go back in and you try to touch it up or correct it, it's gonna show. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it's gonna just jump out like a sore thumb. Um, and that's that part of the thing is doing a watercolor that I fail at all the time because I want to mess with it. See, I want it a certain way. And, yes. Um, and people who are really good at watercolor, you know, they're not manipulating the color the way that you do with oil paint or acrylic. You know, they're not blending and stuff like that. Uh, oh, it's very different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a whole, whole, totally different animal. And when you want to create those effects and things like that, you know, you kind of have to just be able to accept what happens with it, right? How the colors react and spread. Right. Um, and in fact, uh, I was watching something that we may watch here later, and he talks about it a little bit, where you don't, you know, you don't add color into watercolor. You know, you don't like pick up another color and then put the brush down and start moving it around, you know, from one right. color to another. What you do is you start off, you load up your brush, you've got color in it, you fill in a shape, and then if you want a second color or an effect in it, then what you do is you, you know, either clean out your brush or you just go to a second color, pick that up in the brush, and then rather than put the brush down on the paper while it's still wet, 
you take your finger and you squeeze it and you drop color into it. Ah. That it kind of spreads. Because yep. when you go back in with the brush itself, you're disturbing that first layer and you're going to leave these brushes right. and treat yep. it right. as you want. Yep. <laughs> and, and what that does is that sort of destroys that shape or that feel right. with some texture. So where if you just drop color in, then it will kind of flow and do its thing. Oh, that's, in that's interesting. I'll have to try that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of the interesting fun thing of working with watercolor is it's a very different medium and you can't treat it like you do like normal paint because you can't, you can't really blend it the same way. Uh, right. It's like once that water is down on that paper, it's going to kind of go where it wants to. And if you try to kind of manipulate it with a brush, you can lift stuff out. But once that water starts sort of evaporating and, mm -hmm. and you know, then all you get is streaks. Yes. <laughs> and, the, and the brush that show. And, you know, not necessarily what you want. <laughs> so. It's, yeah. Thank you. It's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to try that dropping and squeezing the brush. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, and I think I've, I've shown this before, where a lot of times when I'm trying to lay in an area of watercolor, I'll start with just clear water, you know, and, and the, yeah. Piece, yeah. Yeah, the pieces right. are flat. And, right. you know, and so what I'll do is I'll take clear water and I'll fill in that shape. And then I'll, you know, dry out the brush and my paint has already got water standing in it, you know, in, in the, uh, right. right. and I'll go pick up a color and I'll drop it into one part of that shape. And then I'll, clean it out and I'll go pick yeah. up another color and maybe a third or fourth color and you know let yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying, try it, try it out, yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you, you can get some really fun kind of interesting color effects right. um, when you're painting like that the thing you have to keep in mind is value mm -hmm. you know? and whether or not you want to keep the same value everywhere or whether you want to create a gradation Right. So you're gonna you're gonna pick your colors based on, you know, like there's natural colors like violets and dark blues and dark greens that you know have a dark value, and then right. your warmer colors, your reds, your oranges, and things generally tend to be a lighter value or feel lighter, yeah. right? Yeah. And so if you want to create yeah. a, a gradation, you know, from dark to light you might start with a dark purple or something and then put an orange or a red on the other side of it, you know, and, and that will give you that light effect of, you know, it turning. So, so there's, there's lots of things you can do with it. You know? yeah. Yeah. And I'm aware of that and I still fail at it all the time. So, <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, long and short is it, right. it sounds easy and ain't so easy. So. But it's worth playing with. It really yeah, it's, it's really fun. Yeah. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> so let's go back and let's look at uh, now that I have your drawings. <laughs> okay, Armando, what's going on? <laughs> All right, anyway. This and you put something, uh, a funny right. face there. Yeah, I had your drawing up. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah, it looked funny. It looked funny? Oh, okay. A lady, yeah. Uh huh. All right. So, uh, so this is your sort of three quarter rear view of this classical head of, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that she in Greek would be Aphrodite and um, in Roman would. Uh, Diana, yeah, would be the, the Roman name of it. Um, anyway, you know, very classical bust. Uh, you got the you got the top structure, you know, of the sculpture. Um, the thing that seems to be, you know, odd here <laughs> is you, and I know it's it's hard to see when you're looking at the actual object itself. 
but the transition from the plane moving vertically on the neck mm -hmm. down to this one that's coming towards you, you know, here at the shoulder. And you've got a little bit of an indication because of the change of value. You know, this being a little bit darker, this getting a little lighter because the light is hitting at a different angle. So you got a little bit of that, but you probably could have pushed it a little bit further. Let's go back and look at the uh, actual image. So you see here how much brighter in the right. Range. Yeah, and it's it really is kind of a triangular shape here, and then this is darker, yeah. you know, going vertical, right? Um, and that would have helped, you know, give you, you know, yeah, do that, right? Yeah, you know, get that to move back a little bit. Okay. Um, on mine, yeah, it looks a little. <laughs> yeah, it looks a little flat, right, right in there. Yeah, 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 because yeah, it, it doesn't have that transition in there. Uh, that's the first thing I picked up on, you know, in looking at it. But, you know, as far as you using the pencil and, uh, you know, beginning to lay down values and tones and things like that, um, you're improving. You're getting better. It's not looking scratchy. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay. Hey, that's... <laughs> That's a big deal. It is. You know, it takes a while to kind of build up that skill, that feel, you know, for laying that stuff down. Um, so you're getting that, you know, and uh, and that's good. So, hey, you're making progress. And you're seeing values, you know, dark and light shapes. Right? Um, in your next drawing, okay, this is the other view. This is a three-quarter from the front, right? And yes. Again, you know, you chose not necessarily to do the whole piece. Um, and so you just concentrated, you know, really on the front fa facial plane. Correct. Yeah. And then you began to show some of the transitions to the back of the head, uh, but you really developed them. You know, you kind of stayed right in here. Okay. Right. Now, yep. with that, uh, what I would say is that you sort of reversed your values right if you squint your eye down you know the the stronger darks are like under the nose you know just under the eyelid here out to the yep. corner of the eye you know uh, the corners of the mouth and the mouth and then the uh this plane on the underside of the hair see so you've got you know those real strong darks in there and in your case you know you got the dark of the eye right uh but then you took the nose itself and you really could have punched in you know something much darker in here you know under under the underside of the lip and the mm -hmm. lip. and then you know really getting that darker plane under there under the hair right See, so would have kind of given you, would have given you something that you know you could read as okay, moving around the form, correct, and kind of described it. So, so I mean, spend. I guess my my advice to you would be spend a little bit of time squinting your eye down, mm -hmm. looking at the value structure, right. You know, the value structure is more important than all the features, right? Right. The features are kind of secondary. Uh, but, right. you know, getting that where the light and the shadow is will kind of describe the form for you, you know, and line won't do that. So, uh, so spend a little more time doing that. Mm hmm Okay? Okay. Got all right. Thank you. And then we're going to go down to June Wang. And this is June's drawing, okay? And June, squint your eye down, okay? And so when, when you squint your eye down on, and this is the same view that John had, right? Um, so you saw that, you know, most of this plane of the face was in some kind of shadow, and then you had a shadow here under the form of the hair, right? And if I squint my eye down, that seems to work, okay? The, 
the thing I would say is you could have taken like the values under the neck uh, and pushed them, you know, even darker, you know, up under the hair. Could have gotten it even darker than you've got. You know, where you emphasize the value was under the nose, which is fine, the mouth and all. But you see, it keeps everything focused right here, where that, again, pushing that value back could have really helped, right? Describe, describe the shape of the face and also under the neck. Because if this were darker under here, then all of this would move forward, right? And the neck would move up under. So let's go back and look at it again. Okay. See, if you look at the image, squint your eye down. You see how much um, darker yeah. it is under here and here? Yes. And it leaves all of this. It's dark, but it kind of makes it feel more like a middle value, right? Because it's not mm -hmm. as dark as up under here so, or here. And that's, and that's really kind of the key for all of you is, you know, I think a lot of times when you start drawing, you know, you just look at the object and you're trying to copy the shapes and the forms, um, but you're not squinting your eye down and really seeing the value structure. And that's really important, okay? That'll, that'll help a lot because if you did, you know, you'd see like a really, really strong dark, you know, that's kind of in a crescent here kind of repeated here, and then same thing here, just kind of moving the opposite direction. See, so they're curves, you know, but the, the big dark curves in here that kind of give you the sense of movement, you know, to the statue, which we know isn't moving at all, but you, know, you get the illusion of it. So, uh, so squint, you know, keep your eyes squinted, look, you know, Look at things, you know, squint down, see the values. All right, now, all right, so there's your drawing again. And now you did this, and it looks like a bridge or set of stairs. Is this, uh, is this that Led Zeppelin song, Stairway to Heaven? Yes. Ah, <laughs> okay. Are you a Led Zeppelin fan? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a side of you we never knew, you know, June is over there rocking out the Led Zeppelin still, you know, like, wow. okay. Um, you know, it's an interesting painting, June. It's an interesting idea. Okay. So what, what brought this about? You know, why, how, what inspired you to paint this? Because spiritual. Yeah. I believe God. Uh -huh. Yeah, I will go to the heaven. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, and that's fine. I mean, you know, it's a, you know, it's a great idea, right? And you know, visually, you know, it tells a story, right? Now, you know, look at the use of color and composition, and let's talk about that a little bit. Okay. Okay. So you've got, uh, you know, we know where our eye level is, right? Because we've got a very strong horizon. Let's see where it is. Okay, there it is. We've got a very strong horizon line back there, right? And so we can see, you know, that's our horizon line. So we know where our eye level is. Okay. So where does that put us? Okay. So that, you know, in scale of the stair, you know, our head or our eyes are really right at that line right there. Okay. And so, all right, that feels like, you know, it's plausible. You know, we could, you know, be in a, a, a place like that. Um, you know, you've got lots of activity, you know, here in the foreground and stronger, like darker values. So you've got higher contrast, you know, in here and in the corner here, right? Which kind of anchor the composition down and also, you know, makes you feel like, okay, because of the contrast here, all of this is much closer to us. You know, this is around us immediately. And then as it moves back, 
you know, all of this stuff is getting further away, right? So, so that part is working, okay? Now your stairway, okay? Uh, your stairway is pretty close to center on this, okay? And yeah. That's, that's the thing, you know, that I would think about a little bit more, okay? Now, there's lots of ways that you could have put that stairway in there, right? Uh, and having it go right up from the center um, is a solution. You know, it may not compositionally be the best solution. Uh, like, for example, you could start it here, but in, in, instead of going kind of up straight in front of us, it could have angled and come around and curved more. So you had more movement, kind of like an S movement through the composition, you know, to take us back there. Um, that might have worked a little bit better. Uh, okay. Yeah. Because it's such a strong element right in the middle, you know, it's, mm -hmm. kind of, yeah. you see it and then it's kind of hard to get away from it and kind of move around through the paint, right? Um, so composition is important, you know. Now, what you, where you went with it, you know, up here in the clouds, I like what you did with your with your skyline and your clouds here. Um, you know, you got some nice shapes in there and really nice color and the movement, you know, coming diagonally across rather than just moving straight back and forth across the composition. Um, so that was a nice contrast to the water. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of nice elements in here. And you know the color overall is like really pleasing and really very nice. Um, I guess the main two comments that I would like to leave you with to think about is think about your composition more. And then the other part is get more paint on the canvas. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because all the yeah, all the paint feels kind of thin, you know, kind of uh -huh. like you know. Yeah, yeah. There's not really a lot there. Okay. Yes. And if, if this is a painting, right, then this is a acrylic. 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 Yeah. 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 But you still want to get a little paint on there. Okay. 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 Yeah. Now that is unless you wanted to use it like watercolor. See? But the thing is, you didn't really use it like watercolor and you didn't really use it like oil. And it's, it just kind of looks like thin paint right now. Like you, you know, like you've got your first initial layer now, but you're going to come back and put, you know, more uh, paint. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you know, don't be stingy with paint, you know? <laughs> if gonna, okay. If you're going to paint, use paint, you know, put it on there. And, uh, um, okay. Because honestly, you know, that's, that's the kind of the beauty of painting is what the paint does itself, you know, how it goes down on the surface and stuff. And, you know, if you get enough on there, you can act, actually manipulate it and play with it and get it to do some really interesting stuff. If it's real kind of thin and kind of weak, like it is, you know, on the surface here, then uh -huh. you can't do much with it. it. It's kind of like John's watercolor. He was asking how not yeah, yeah. to get it to look like you know it's scrubbed so much well same thing with acrylic if you don't have enough paint down there it's going to be uh, nice okay. freaky and stuff so so you know more paint you know more paint on the surface would help okay okay um, thank you yeah and let's see rebecca is not here you know we know she's taking care of her husband Richard, did Richard ever make it? I don't think so. Whoop, okay, that's not what we want to do. Ah. We want to find, where's John? <sighs> okay, this is still so funny. All right. Um, I guess Richard's not here. So Susan. I'm here. Yes, you are. I can see. 
Yeah. yeah and I, I didn't realize when I was drawing this that I had the tablet tilted <laughs> sideways. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of it turned out sideways, but um, <laughs> I don't know much. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not supposed to be sideways. It's supposed to yeah. be straight. So the whole piece of paper was sideways. So. Right. Uh, so I got two questions for you about it. Okay. Um, okay. So when you drew this, you know, you, you had the pad angled, but did you also have it laying flat on the table? No, I was holding it kind of. You were holding it up? Oh, okay. Yeah, because it, it kind of went off, you know, did that kind of distorted thing a little bit, you know, because the okay. head is so much bigger than the, the rest of the statue. Um, okay. Well, the fact is, it being angled, I actually like it. You know, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> well, you know, I make you look at it and kind of like, oh, okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna say kind of a lot of the same things I already said to uh, June and John, uh, values, okay? So you're beginning to see value better. You know, you're making some improvements in that. And you're, you're beginning to also use the pencil and being able to lay down tones uh, and kind of flatter, softer areas. Um, and I want you to keep working with that because you know, you, you're not quite there yet, okay, but you are getting better. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, maybe at some point, you know, rub the drawing back. You know, once you get some of those darks and things, Take a paper towel or your hands, you know, your fingers are fine, and just rub areas back and soften them, and then go back in and, you know, build up more value over that. Um, okay. You know, that will, that'll that help get you kind of more consistent gradations and tones and values, okay? Now, along with that, okay, um, you're paying a lot more attention to the edges and the type of line that you're making, okay? Because I'm, okay. I remember, and I'm sure you do too, at some point, you know, all of that was kind of the same, right? But now right. you're being variety and you're, you're paying attention to, okay, mm -hmm. I'm making this a darker line because I know that there's a value attached to it that's appropriate, right? And it's good, it's good to see you looking at that and seeing that and uh, so so keep keep doing it okay okay you're headed the right direction okay um mm -hmm. here we have uh oh god what was his name uh he, he was like one of the characters in the avengers you know he had like <laughs> his his whole body had turned into like rock well, that, that's kind of what this looks like. But of course, it does actually look like that in the first place. So this was the face in, you know, broken down in planes. And okay, you pretty much so have the idea of that. Um, again, you know, it's just a matter of building up your values. And the thing is, okay, if you squint your eye down, all of the values across here seem to be kind of the same, right? It's, it all kind of falls into one value. When in fact, it's like each one of these planes would have a separate and distinct value. So this should be darker overall than this, right? Which may be darker than this, which may, you know, and this may be the lightest one and, you know, I mean, we can go back and look at it, but each one will have a distinct value. You know, there's no, there's no two planes sitting next to each other here that are going to be the same. And, you know, because you have so many different planes moving at light, at least in four or five different mm -hmm. orientations to the same light, you know, you're going to have at least five or six values. In it. And really what you've got right now is, mm -hmm you're kind of pushing it toward three okay so you need okay. to kind of broaden that out um let's go back and look at uh, you know, our friendly fellow there 
Here he is. Okay. So if you look at this, all right, squint your eye down while you do it. You'll see that the value like underneath the brow ridge here and like underneath the bottom lip, the upper lip, uh, back here at the, the corner where the head, you know, turns really to the side. Um, eyes. And under the eyes, those are all kind of equal, right? They're very close. Um, but then you look at the, uh, you look at the planes moving across and it seems like as you squint your eye down, <clears throat> It's like this part of this plane right here and the lower part of this plane are about the same, but in between gets darker, like right in here. And then this is quite a bit darker than this. And then the side over here is quite a bit darker, you know, than the plane it's next to. And so you get this, you know, change in plane as it moves around. Um, and it tells you that it's actually, you know, moving around. And the contrast, you know, in, or the change in value will tell you how quickly it's changing direction. So if there's a, if there's a big contrast here and not much of one here, that tells you that this is changing more, more rapidly, more abruptly than the transition here. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Oh. Uh, you know, some of this didn't print real well on my printer. I don't know. Um, on your printer? It's not, it's not oh, quite as dark as it is on that picture. So oh, okay. um, I'm, just, I'm just looking at what my printer did and what. Um, okay. So, so you took the image that I sent you, you printed it out on your printer. Because I had to leave the class early. I had to right. leave before yeah. this and the last one were shut. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I do see it darker on there than I do on the page I'm, on, on this page I'm looking at. Um, yeah. and, the thing, and the thing about printing stuff out, you know, is that if you're printing photographs and stuff, it's like you'll see changes in, or values in the photograph and then by the time you print it, some of those will drop out because the printer isn't nearly as sensitive as the photograph. And so you're reducing you know, uh, the contrast every step along the way. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I, I sent you these and so you had the JPEGs. Um, if I were going to try to draw from something, I, uh -huh. I, I would use my iPad or wherever I had the image versus trying to print it. Okay. Look at it. Because again, when you print it, it's it's going to change it. Okay. Okay, I'll do that the next. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Good um, okay. So next drawing. All right. So this is the three quarter view. Okay, from the back. And all right. Now you didn't you didn't get the tone laid down as smoothly as you did in some of the other drawings. Um, you know, and so it needs to be kind of softened and rubbed back. But as far as your proportion, your angles, things like that, all of that looks pretty good. Um, this is actually more lineal than it is tonal at this point. And again, you know, you're beginning to see the changes, you know, or how to change your line weight. Uh, and you're getting more variety, you know, in, in the types of lines and things that you're making. So that's good. You know. So uh, we got Veronica next. Okay. Now Veronica's drawing, um, and this is the front kind of three quarters. Now you see you rubbed it back, right, Veronica? Okay. Yeah. And it gave it all kind of this overall value or tone. And then were you? It looks like you were using a kneaded eraser, right? I did, but maybe not enough. Yeah, maybe not. Okay. Now, there's a trick to using kneaded erasers. Okay. okay. Uh, you can use them and you lift an area out, but after not long, you know, two or three times trying to pick stuff up, 
you need to turn the kneaded eraser to a new fresh area. Because, oh, okay. Yeah, because once you get graphite in it, <coughs> it stops lifting, you know, it stops erasing. Um, and then once you've kind of worked all the areas of the kneaded eraser, the nice thing is you just sit and pull it and knead it and all of that softens up again and then you can erase more from it, okay? Like silly putty. Yeah, like silly putty. Um, so yeah, you gotta keep working it and then lift okay. it a little bit and then work it a little bit more and lift, you know. Um, you know, it's kind of a slow process, but it works really well. It's, it's a good effective way of particularly going back in and cutting in, you know, your mid-tones and lights. Okay. And the thing with the eraser is it's just like the pencil in the sense that the amount of pressure, you know, that you put down on the eraser will determine how much of the graphite or how fast you lift it off. So if you want to say, make like a really soft sort of gradation or something, uh, you could start, you know, say lifting, you know, like here, up here in the corner, right, like right under the eye and just keep working, you know, and then after a couple of strokes, turn the eraser or, or pull it and knead it and then go back uh, up and start again, you know, and work a little further out and then do that again and work a little further up and you can actually kind of create a gradation, you know, with the pencil, you know, with the graphite that you have on the surface, you know, and you, you can really build these really nice subtle gradations, you know, working that way. Okay. Now, a lot of times, you know, when I, when I will work with a drawing like this, you know, I'll lay in kind of like my darks and stuff and put an overall tone. And then I just rub it back. I mean, I really rub it back, you know, and just get okay. a good gray, you know, kind of spread over most of the paper. And then when I start lifting out the eraser, you know, I'll, I'll kind of work the eraser and soften it, but then I'll pull it out to kind of a long edge or a point. And rather than, you know, taking out like little blobs, I'll actually start cutting lines, like hatching, right? And so I'll work one area and kind of lift it and then clean the eraser again, go back and do more, you know, and just maybe change the angle just a little bit. Same way I would with a pencil, say. And um, it really is a very effective way at creating all these different values, you know, and particularly in your, your lights and midtones that it's really hard to get by putting a pencil down and laying in a tone and then even rubbing it back you know, uh, most of the time you'll get those probably too dark uh, or too overstated. And so you're just taking the eraser and kind of working it back just a little bit, you know, will get you kind of where you need to go, right? Okay. But, but you're headed the right direction. You know, you're using kind of the right process and it's just, you know, keep working with the tool, you know, keep working with the tool, okay. find out what okay. you can do with it, okay? Uh, and don't, don't be afraid, you know, because Worst case scenario, if you lift out too much. Put it back. Yeah, you, you can put it back. Yeah, you can always add it. Yeah. All you really have to do is just take your finger, like out there in the outside edges, rub your finger on it, and then take it, and then fill that area that you got too light in. And so you can move that graphite around all kinds of different ways. Okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> we have, you know, basically the same kind of comments here. Uh, now here you did more lifting out and you can begin to see, you know, actually that that graphite or the uh, kneaded eraser with the graphite can really lift quite a bit of that out. Um, you just have to be patient with it. Okay. Now the thing I would kind of recommend really on both of these drawings is like, you know, you're, you're keeping it real soft at first. Okay. And you're working with your eraser and the graphite. Um, and then kind of when you get the values where you want them, that's when you come back in with the pencil again and you put down an edge or a line in some of these places okay, to really okay. make the drawing feel a little more solid. Okay? Okay. You know, I mean, in some places you're not going to put a line because you have, you know, a light value 
like the shoulder here, right? Maybe yeah. against, you know, the background. And so, you know, maybe you don't see a line there. Maybe, you know, maybe this value and the background are almost the same and it's what creates what we call a lost edge, right? And so you can have those, you know, but in other places you're going to have, you know, pretty distinct edges and lines. Okay. And again, that's, that's a way of getting more variety of different types of lines, values, textures, tones, you know, in your drawing. And that conveys a lot more information than, you know, just a line by itself. Okay. Okay. Um, Armando, I did not. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. But, uh, I passed you up first and you came in late. So, so now we're going to talk about your drawing. Okay. Your two drawings, actually. And uh, just making uh, making faith herself. So that lady. Uh huh. Well, yes, you you and I. Okay. We're going to talk about a few different things here. Okay, let's talk about what you got right. Okay, let's talk about, you know, the fact that you saw this dark value and the, the curve, right? So this head does not look flat. Okay, and the only reason it doesn't look flat is because of this right here. Okay, you got that in there, you saw the difference in the value, you know, your value for the top of the head and your value here is uh, about, you know, about right, okay? Now I'm getting a funny, uh, hang on. I will be right back. I need to go get a power cord. Ow. Before my Mac value. See, that's what happens when you have to relocate. Here we go. There had to be something, right? Yay. Okay. All right. We got power. All right. <clears throat> so, so you got that. Now, Armando, are you there? Uh-huh. I'm here. Okay. Well, we can't see you. We just saw the top of your head there. Um, okay, so now you got that, but then you got this real strong outline all around the figure. And I talk about this a lot, okay? You need to make those different. They can't all be the same because if they're all the same, right? That means that that cheekbone and that the bridge of the nose and that the jawline and that the back of her neck and the front of her neck, they're all equally close to us, okay? And that can't be, okay? Because we're trying to actually push, you know, that cheekbone back there and the eye socket, we're trying to push it back, right? And we're trying to bring the nose in front of it. So the line has to be different if you're gonna use a line, right? Now, if you're using value, it's a different thing. But line work, you can't keep all of these the same. So you're gonna make a variety of different types of lines. So let's go back and look at the actual image. And so, hmm, okay. So right here, we've got a very dark value. You know, here we've got a dark value. The nose itself, okay, so right in here, let's blow this up. You know, along this, from this point down to here, you know, that line could be very sharp, you know, very defined. 
But once you get past that, what happens? You almost don't see it, do you? It almost goes away, it disappears, right? And you don't see it again until the nose starts turning underneath, right? And again, right here, where this shadow is up against this mid-tone, which is the other side of the face, again, you can have a very sharp line there, okay? But you don't need one right here, okay? Uh, how about the cheekbone or the cheek, you know, and jawline out here? Well, again, here, you could almost go without a line. Okay, um, it almost disappears into the background. Same thing for the forehead. It's held by that dark of the hair just a little bit. Um, but as this moves down, what happens to the value? It gets more, it, it gets darker, right? So it's more of kind of like a mid-tone. So you could have a line there but it doesn't need to be very thick and it doesn't need to be very dark, right? The line here can be much darker and sharper, right? The line here can be sharp, but it's gotta be kind of a mid-tone, right? So it's like with each of these areas, you know, you can look at it and kind of figure out if I were gonna make a line to describe that, what kind of line would I make, right? And the line right here along the side of the face even though it's a similar value, right? This would be a very sharp line. And the line up here for the top of the eyebrow, you see they're almost the same value, but you see how much softer this is? It's kind of fuzzy, right? Over here, it's really quite sharp. Okay. So as you're drawing things, you gotta think about the value and you gotta think about what kind of line do I need to make? What am I trying to describe? You know, is it going to be a crisp line? Is it going to be a fuzzy line? Okay. Those make a difference. See? It's kind of like the hair up here, right? A lot of people take a pencil and they, you know, make that wavy line. You know, and that's it. The problem is that a lot of times it comes out being a very crisp, hard line. And you, uh, when you look at this, do you see anything that's really crisp and hard here? Maybe just in a couple of little spots, but for the most part, it's kind of soft, okay? kind of fuzzy. Right? So that's, um, you know, that's one of the things I want you to start paying more attention to as you're drawing is not only, you know, the shape and the proportion of things, but also what kind of line am I going to use to describe that? Okay. Um, now, that being said, let's talk about the proportions. Okay. Overall, the proportion of the head isn't bad. Right. And she does have kind of a big nose. Right. She mm -hmm. just does. Um, is it as big as you've made it? Maybe not quite. Okay. But it's not that far off. Um, but then we look at the eyes. Okay. And it's like this eye almost works. See, it almost sits back there in the eye socket, but this one doesn't, right? And it doesn't look like this eye really has anything to do with this one, right? Because it looks kind of flat and it doesn't really look like an eye because it doesn't feel like it's, you know, like there's a ball there. And you see, that's what really is going on with the structure of the eye. It's if you look at it, see right in here, you can almost see a, a round ball. When you look at the shadows and everything, you know, now, yes, it has an eyelid stretched across it and a bottom eyelid stretched across it, but it really is, there's a ball there, right? It's kind of sticking part way out. And, um, and so when you draw, you know, eyes, mouths, nose and things, you got to think about the structure underneath. Right? And so what's really going on there is you got this ball that this eyelid is going to wrap around. Okay. So I have a, a special request of you, Armando. Okay. I want for the next week or so, 
while you're on the internet, I want you to keep a uh, sketch pad next to your computer. And as you're looking at, you know, different people on the computer and stuff like that, I want you to try to draw their eye. And I want you to look for, you know, start off by drawing that, that circle or that ball first, and then look at how the eye lid and things wrap around it. Okay, and try to draw that just for practice. Think you could do that? Mm -hmm. Try. You try. Okay, good. That's all we can ask, all right? Uh, but I think if if you try drawing them and really looking, you know, as you're drawing, you'll begin to figure it out, and you'll you'll get something that'll look more like an eye. Okay. Um. All right. So this is the rear three quarter view. All right. Uh, again, you got the idea of the angle and things, but you know, the proportions, um, you know, I mean, the, the side plane of the face and things are much bigger than the nose, right? And in your drawing, mm, the nose looks pretty big, right? So really pay attention. See, you really, you know, when you look at this area, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Was that you, Jim? No. No. <laughs> Somebody's computer went wild. Um, somebody's playing video games or something. Anyway, uh, the the side plane of the face here is really much bigger in proportion, you know, to the nose, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, pay attention to those. And of course, you know, the two of these together are really much smaller you know than this whole shape of the hair and the neck which is actually even bigger than the face itself um so again you know look at those proportions right not just the height you know and where they sit vertically but where they sit you know going across horizontally Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I think. Mm. All right. I think we covered everybody. All right. Except for Eloise. Uh, Eloise sent this in. Okay. And uh, so, you know, she did a good job, you know, of getting the proportions and she saw the contrast mm. and the values. Um, now she's kind of broken this down into like three values and she could have used more uh, because the dark underneath the neck here could have been a lot stronger and under the hair and under this eyelid right here, she could have really pushed the values on. If she would have gotten this area as dark as she did under the nose and the same thing here and here, you know, then it would feel like it was a little more round, had a little more volume to it. Okay. Um, now we haven't run into her online. I think she, I think she attended one online class and, uh, this is Elaine Johnson and she just joined us. Um, <clears throat> and so this, this was the week that we were drawing the orchids. Okay. And, uh, I want to say this is colored pencil. I mean, it could be watercolor. It's possible. Um, but yeah, yeah, she did a pretty nice job on that. Um, let's see what else have we got. I think that's about it. And I think everybody here today was here yesterday and I showed you guys these. Uh, this is two watercolors that I did up at the Chattahoochee River and this is in Valley, not far from my house. Um, and so, you know, both of them, probably about an hour and a half, maybe two hours at the most. Um, but I've been using a lot of watercolor lately because um, it's just easy to, to travel with, you know, and you don't have to spend a lot of time setting stuff up. You know, you pretty much so put a chair down on the table, get your pad out, and, you know, pour a little water in a container and you can, you know, start painting. 
Yeah. So that's it. That's all I got. Okay. Let's see what time it is. It's three twenty. Um, I want to. I pulled a couple of videos. Okay. And these, <clears throat> well, they're main. You know, they are art related. Okay. Um, two of them have to do with Black History Month, okay? And they're, uh, they're worth seeing, and they're short for the most part. Uh, so I'm going to play one of them and, uh, and then get some feedback from you guys, okay? Yeah, okay. Now, as... Where did it go? Uh, not that one. Yes, this one. Um, as hmm, is this the uh, as most of you know, it was Black History Month this month, and uh, yes. Often with calmer confidence technology, but if you purchase art with. And so this particular video, video this is, is about a, a, a W. Is it W. B. Du Bois? I put my uh, my expression on you know canvas. Paint and a brush allow run. Okay. All right. I don't know what happened to the sound. Someone who takes in, you know, information and, and spills it out. Instead, he was told to stay within the lines. There was this, I guess, stereotypical type of way of seeing, you know, right. artists. So they, I would have people go, oh, well, well you're a black artist. You Hang on. We've seen this guy before. This is not the one. Uh, uh, that. Mm -hmm. that ain't it. Thank you very much. Well, let's stop sharing that. Hang on one second. Because I've got a video that I actually want you guys to watch. Let's go back to... I mailed it to myself, so... Hmm. Uh, there we go. that. Now, let's try it again. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll get it working. strikes me the most about Du Bois was he was proud of being African-American. He wanted to be African-American and American. 
the word Negro, uh, he fought to have it capitalized in, in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And for me, that is such a powerful statement, the idea to, to have this word capitalized. He really understood, I guess, the power of, of art to, to make people understand race, and in particular, like um, human relations. He died on the eve of the March to Washington. He died on the eve of the Civil Rights Movement. And I think that Du Bois was potentially such a powerful figure, and the government was terrified of him for that reason. Du Bois is more like a deity. His practice has it being important to me. There's several different people who I kind of put in that little pantheon of individuals or things that move me. It's from musicians to grandparents to best friends and people who have come and gone. And I try to carry whatever I may have gotten from their presence. It's almost, that's like the fuel for the work for me. How do you honor this person in a way? My work has always been about honor, um, pride, celebrating who I am. And um, then the one with the double consciousness piece that I was playing with was really playing with this idea of this mirror image and um, in, in many ways, it's kind of like a self-portrait as, um, as an African-American artist operating in different worlds. Making work, is, it's, it's difficult to talk about the process because it's a lot of things. My studio becomes more like my church. So I have questions, I go to my I go to my studio and ask questions, the past, but then also the present. What would Du Bois say if he came to Braddock and saw the reality of what we were facing in the 1980s, all the steel mills had collapsed. And so what was left was a very small population, predominantly African-American families but not much of an infrastructure or any type of uh, economic stability. At that time, Braddock was pretty much abandoned by the local, state, and government uh, support. So as a child, I didn't realize the magnitude of how heavily we were impacted by disinvestment, but I knew that uh, I was born into poverty and that it was a hard life. Braddock, Pennsylvania is located nine miles outside of Pittsburgh along the Monongahela River. My family migrated there in the early 1900s to work in Andrew Carnegie's steel mill. I was able to start building the body of work that I have been doing for over 11 years now on Braddock. And I saw, you know, a speech by Du Bois at his high school in 1930 about the condition of the Housatonic River. I just started smiling because I knew like this was it. This is what would help me figure out the series that I needed to produce. And he goes on to say, the town, the whole valley has turned its back upon the river. They have sought to get away from it. They have neglected it. They have used it as a sewer, a drain, a place for throwing their waste and their awful. And so I wanted to parallel my personal and autobiographical experience of living along the river with the way Du Bois felt about what had happened to the Housatonic River from since he was a boy and then became an adult. And I was thinking, you know, for 10 years I've been on foot photographing Braddock. I'm going to get up in the air. And I go up 
into the air to get this aerial view of Braddock. Here we are looking at it in real time, real color, like the flesh tissue and the makeup of this town along this river. I was born by a golden river and in the shadow of two great hills five years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And the house was quaint with clapboards running up and down, neatly trimmed, and there were five rooms, a tiny porch. We wanted to be a master class to study the life and the legacy of the Du Bois. We, did, we read the credo. They wrote their own credos. They illustrated their own credos just to get the sense of entering the, 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 the inspiration of Du Bois. I was inspired to write about what I believed in. And here's our very dark water. It's going to take a long time to dry. So. What was very important was their own interpretation that's uniquely theirs of the credo from Dark Law. When it came to the boys, it was really thinking about some of his essays, it's just about women and African-American women in particular and sort of our place and sort of the importance of African-American women. The, the course of my trajectory and sort of my studio practice begins from my experimentation and exploration with using uh, craft materials and taking those craft materials and trying to integrate a low art into sort of a high art dialogue. The perception of hair that has its own sort of like long history um, for African Americans of sort of the acceptance of your really fine coarse curly hair to your straight Hair, how that sort of defines how people perceive you. And so for me, I wanted to sort of bring some of that to the forefront as the idea of portraiture. My name is Chuli Maratu. I was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1970. I uh, lived here until 1995 when I went to graduate school. In Rhode Island School of Design. And since 2007, I've been living part time in Berlin. But there's this groundwork and foundation that was laid out by someone like Du Bois, who understanding of self and perspective and possibility. And so this comes, I, I think, that in, in trying to negotiate all of these realities, there's a certain place of locating or finding possibility or different possibility for who you can be and how you can be. So these etchings are made trying to invent make sense or excavate my own mark making and language. Art has to be more about kind of wrestling with, with truths. What did Du Bois say? And what I want to know about is, is the truth. I want to know about how this work is, is, is going to further and, and, and progress, you know, people's understanding of, of race and race relations. I'm interested in the Star of Ethiopia for a lot of different reasons. For me, uh, what really was most interesting is, is the idea of, of Du Bois, the scholar, as, as being like a creative, you know, force. 
being able to produce and to write a, you know, a pageant in 1913 that was about the 10,000 year history of, of the black race, you know, and, and to be able to have enough resources to have costumes made, to have dancers, to have a director of uh, dramatics. It's a narrative in, in, in a form that I'm not used to dealing with. It's, it's a pageant, which means it's about like postures. It's about gestures. It's about music. It's about going on stage and not necessarily saying it, but being that character and then walking off stage and allowing this processional of, of costumes and music and, and people as a 21st century artist, it's like, well, what is a pageant? You know, and I start thinking about music videos. These small moments, these characterizations. Du Bois has uh, one of the protagonists, uh, you know, as, as the veiled woman. And then so, I, I, you know, what I'm working on uh, today is, is, is exploring this idea of like uh, Negro womanhood through um, the veiled woman. When a time period where, where was extremely hard for, for African Americans to live, he was, you know, collecting, you know, ten thousand dollars, you know, from people to be able to to mount this play and and, and showcasing it in, in ballparks, um, in major cities. One of the the greatest attributes of of Du Bois is that he really began, you know, could understand what it was like to be a black in America, but also you know, he, he took that dangerous step to, 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 to be curious, to say, well, what, is, what are white people, you know, thinking about me interpreting blackness? I prepared the work in my studio for a few weeks in London, packed everything together and sent it, shipped it here. The work was installed by Heidi Johnson, a professional paper hanger. And I kind of freaked out a little bit because I've never done this before. I've never, ever had somebody else install my work. I was kind of trying to plan the piece that every single thing that I sent Heidi had to be where I said it was going to be. Oh, I found it so difficult, but it worked out. I, I sent her a visual map. This piece is, um, is called Held, February the 23rd. The initial inspiration came from a trip to Ghana in 2005. And the transatlantic slave trade has long been an interest of mine. And I've long wanted to actual, actually travel to the sites. On my return from that trip, this piece of work, Hold, came about. And basically it is hold it's um, a holding space for um, um, Africans before they were transported and in in this exhibition held I wanted to make something life-size so that, that my audience the viewer can is, is literally held and pulled in I consider the figures in my piece of work in held 23rd of February in some ways as the souls of black folk. They are, they're ciphers, they're, they're kind of ghosts of African peoples. Du Bois was indicted for not having registered as an agent of a foreign power. He received the indictment on his 83rd birthday. And Du Bois's position, along with the other members of the Peace Information Center, was that they were not agents of a foreign power. They're five files. They're predominantly centered between his 83rd year and his 94th year. The files are redacted, which means, you know, blacked out. So my coming to terms was to remove, remove them, to point them out by cutting them out. And I built an audio narrative, which in my mind really has to do with the influence of Du Bois. And then there is a third component, a tabloid. 
the idea is for it to be distributed across campus, it does form a narrative. And so very publicly indicted, very quietly found innocent. In a lot of people's minds, forever guilty. And ultimately, you know, he moved to Ghana when he was 90, 93, 94, and died within a year. It occurred to me that I could name a flower for the boys and that I could have thousands of people participate with me in the remembrance of, of Du Bois. And in thinking, about, in thinking about this idea, I had actually a peony name for Du Bois and uh, that's been registered with the American Peony Society. It's called the, um, uh, the W.E.B. Du Bois Peony, but its common name will be the Hope Peony. Sort of an amazing moment in time, historically. You know, you produce this work and it's about race. Well, it's partly about race, but considerably more. And that's the thing that really interests me, that considerably more. How do we begin to approach blackness and understand blackness as something that is much more complex and complicated than merely black? I'm always thinking about, you know, how to activate the space, how to activate the wall, so that the, the, the movement isn't completely linear and flat, that you, have to, that you have to look up and that you have to look down. And I've sort of done some exploration around the peony and its development and I have photographs at the site and photographs of complementary florals that will go along with this peony uh, in order to anchor our garden. Mm -hmm. So my, my garden for the boys it's a garden so that people will remember the legacy of an extraordinary man. And I realized at a certain point while looking at another memorial site that I couldn't think of a really great contemplative space for an African-American. And then the question was, you know, Du Bois in our time. So how does that then manifest within, you know, specifically for me right now, currently? So the ideas of civil rights and movements that he was fighting for. I grew up in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, and in 1989, my family emigrated to Canada. We are of many generations in Kenya, uh, of a Goan background, Goan Indian background. So kind of this sort of hybrid identity. I've created a symbolic version of the Encyclopedia for the Negro. And that is a handmade book with black paper. So there's no actual like typing or script or writing in the book. Having the University Color Guard march from the Du Bois Library, marching with this book in a procession, giving it its sort of like acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. How does the performance body uh, produce a gesture of political movement? Mm -hmm. In my practice, I've looked at the power of language, the idea of how does one forget a language growing up in Kenya I uh, spoke Swahili, moving to Canada, that language became lost to me uh, because I wasn't using it. So I'm kind of curious about the process of becoming, the process of being. There's ideas of like, what would this book be? The boys struggled to make it, but it never, it could never, it could never exist. So I've placed my encyclopedia in the space as an intervention. This is kind of like a question of like, well, that wasn't made, but then it is here. 
and it's sitting in this place of, of historic account, which then makes it kind of become an artifact and then kind of like also further, you know, heightens it to become something different. You know, it's, it's, is it mm -hmm. art or is it, is it an artifact in your place within that liminal space? So within my piece, I have created um, a sort of a wall mural using the sort of colors of, um, of the Kenyan flag, which for me symbolizes a home, it symbolizes um, Kenya, which is very specific to me, but also kind of this sort of idea of Africa. And, um, and so, and that was a place that, you know, Du Bois also kind of mentioned and reflects on throughout his work, throughout his work, the idea of, you know, again, of a, again, about a pan Africanism. So I created a series of banners that are talking about an end. And in the end, we find a new beginning. What did you guys think of that? Interesting. Okay. Are you familiar uh, with uh, W. E. B. Du Bois? Not familiar with him at all. I uh, actually be, uh, I really like the sculpture. <laughs> well, now Du Bois himself, yeah, that was Radcliffe Bailey who did the uh, sculptures. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, Du Bois himself was an intellectual, a, a teacher, a writer, a poet, um, you know, and uh, I think he died, I want to say that he, he died, you know, like, I want to say the 40s, like the late 40s, but somebody said that uh, he died like the day before like the civil rights movement, you know, kind of kicked off or, you know, one of the big <laughs> marches. Um, so that would have put it later. So I need to go back and, and find out exactly when that happened. But, uh, you know, he was an interesting, you know, leader, you know, in the African-American community. And so this is like the, I, th I think this was supposed to be the 50th celebration of you know, his death or something like that. Um, you know, and it was obviously, you know, majority African-American artists, but, you know, kind of a full range of different people, you know, kind of talking about him and his contributions and some of the questions that he asked, um, you know, during his lifetime. And so, you know, it, it and that's what this show was really all about, you know. And uh, I need to find out more information about actually where the show was held and when it was held. Um, you know, I have a feeling it's it's nothing that happened in like real recently. Um, I think it was, you know, probably 10, 15 years ago that, uh, that this happened. But um, I'll do some more research on it. But any any of that artwork in particular, you know, you know, John said he, he liked the sculptures. Anybody else have any particular likes? This yeah, I, like, I, I like the sculpture the best. Mm -hmm. Okay. I did, yeah. I mean, the flowers were nice, but um, it was interesting, but I, I really did like the 3D rendition. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought the the mural craft paper was pretty unique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. That was a that was an interesting approach, you know, with silhouettes. Um, it's it's interesting because to me, in looking at the variety of artists that they had, you know, they had very traditional approaches to it, like the sculpture. Um, you know, they had a couple of people doing paintings. Um, but not really representational paintings. You had several people using photography. And then you also had people who were using sort of like what you would call performance. 
Um, and so it wasn't really a piece of artwork. It was sort of, you know, um, almost like an action or, you know, a play or, or something, you know, it was a series of, of, you know, other people doing things and that became the artwork itself. Um, you know, it's like the one lady with the flower, right? Uh, it was all about, it was all about that particular flower, which she actually, you know, as a performance piece, she actually contacted, uh, I, I guess, a group who sort of named, you know, these different flowers, you know, in this case, it's a particular type of peony. And, uh, and she actually had them name this specific species, you know, of peony after Du Bois. You know? So that was actually part of the artwork, you know, was, was getting that officially named and then doing the photography and things, uh, you know, of not only the flower itself, you know, that specific type of flower, but also the, the gardens and things of, uh, I guess, Du Bois's home or, or you know, that area. Um, so some of these, you know, they, they don't fit into your normal traditional, you know, I'm gonna sit down and do a drawing or I'm gonna sit down and do a painting. You know, they're, they're bigger, uh, more complex pieces and you know, one of, one of the challenges, I think, in contemporary art is that artists who are showing, particularly like in academic institutions, and things like that, they still have elements of traditional art. Um, but the art piece itself isn't necessarily the final product, you know, the drawing or the painting. It's, it's the things that happen around, you know, getting to that, you know, getting to that solution. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a different view. It's a different view on artists and art in general and, you know, how, how that works in our society. So, um, anybody, <clears throat> anybody else got anything to say? Did Armando go away, or is Armando? Still looks that there? looks like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we I think we left. Yeah. Okay. Probably nap nap time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's he's probably out on happy hour at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Susan, you have any thoughts on any of this? Yeah. Well, I like the little figurines that the. Lady was hanging in her office. I thought those were, mm -hmm. uh, of the people, mm -hmm. the little ones. Yeah, I thought those were, were cute. They looked like little paper dolls, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I okay. yeah. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to share that was, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it was just you know Black History Month, but beyond that, it's it's sort of the range of you know how how different you know different people can see you know a, a fairly common you know you can all be talking about the same subject and you'll approach it in completely different ways you know or deal with different aspects of it um and the same is true you know within this class or within in the group that we have you know, different. You know, different people are going to use their skill sets, but not only their skill set. It's it's how they perceive it. It's how you approach it, because you are uniquely who you are, say, in your particular experience in life. And um, you know, like for example, you know, I, you know, we could all be sitting around painting the same model, and because we have all these different experiences we can bring other things into it, you know, things from our past and, you know, our upbringing. And in some ways consciously, in some ways maybe totally unconsciously as well. So just, uh, just want you to be aware of that. 
and kind of think about it a little bit. Okay. All right, June, you've been quiet. <laughs> you got it. Always. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, the preacher. Yeah, like a different preacher. It's the yeah, it's the good to know. Everybody's different. Yeah. Do you think you would ever try anything like like some of those different approaches rather than just traditional, you know, drawing and painting? Would you try to get outside your your normal box and do, you know, some of, some of these different approaches? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Well, at least you know they're out there. You know they're available to you. You know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, on that happy note, folks, it is 3.55, and um, I guess I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, anybody got anything that uh, they want to ask before we go away? Anybody need anything? Yep. All right. Then I'm going right, to say adios. It's time for happy hour. Okay. Okay. See everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.